Well, I'm here with my very um, dear colleagues, Dr. Peter Alpert from Montefiore, Albert Einstein, and Dr. Baba Femi Taiwo um, from Chicago. It's very nice to see you both. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to actually tell you both about a patient of mine that's a little unusual, um, which is, this is a tale of long-acting antiretroviral therapy, but it came about in an unusual manner. And to really, you know, speak to this, I mean, oral ART, it, of course, has been revolutionary. It completely changed the morbidity and mortality of the disease, but it's been very difficult for some to stay in care, to take oral ART, to maintain that daily adherence, substance use, mental illness, and homelessness being three major risk factors to not being able to adhere. He actually, my patient, had all three. Yeah. And then pill fatigue but some patients just do not want to be reminded right. that they have HIV or they're traveling or they live with the in-laws or you know something where they just don't want the stigma of a daily pill. This is a 39-year-old male patient of mine who um, actually was going back and forth from Florida and San Francisco during the pandemic. His mother, he's originally from Florida, his mother had been ill. And because of that, he actually was completely derailed with his antiretroviral therapy. And beyond the derailment of not being able to take it steadily because of what was happening during the pandemic, he actually had a very, um, he's a very serious uh, methamphetamine use disorder and just could not take oral ARVs to the point that he uh, broke through several regimens. Um, he uh, had been on um, alvitegavir, cobacistat, uh, emtricitabine, um, TAF in the past and unfortunately on that got an N155H uh, entity mutation, mm -hmm. and then he had an M184V mutation uh, as well. So I had him on darunavir cobacistat taf ftc and he essentially came to me and said, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I cannot take an oral pill. Mm -hmm. I am unable to remember to take it with the stimulant use. It reminds me of HIV, and I'm just going to tell you I simply cannot take oral antiretroviral therapy. But it would be good, good for us to hear from the patient. And I will say one thing, that I um, was biting my nails the entire time as, we, right. as, a, as this happened. So I think it would be good to hear from the patient right now. So I found out that I was positive back in 2009. So for about eight years or so, I stayed undetectable taking the oral meds. I was good about it. and then. My mom got sick and I went back to Florida. And when I went back to Florida is when my health took a dip because I wasn't able to see a doctor very quickly. And then when I did, it wasn't a good situation. So I didn't end up taking meds the whole two years I was in Florida. And then when I came back out here and got reconnected with my doctor, um, I, for some reason, had, I guess, broke that taking the oral meds, you know what I mean? And then the pandemic hit right away after I moved back and I was scared to leave my home and my counts kept going lower and lower and me and my doctor kept trying, I would try, like, I had my friends call me to try to remember, remind me to take meds. I had uh, alarms set and everything and it just, it was not working. And I don't know why, I, I just had, could not remember to take the oral meds. So we, we did, we took a gamble. He actually had a CD4 count of, at this point, um, you know, he was at 18 with the CD4 count. His viral load uh, was extremely high, was above a million. And we made the decision to start him on long-acting antiretroviral therapy. He does not fit the inclusion criteria of either the FLARE study, and then he also doesn't fit the criteria of the ATLAS study, but the inclusion criteria there is that not only did you have to have no history of neurologic failure, but also um, be suppressed on, at least for six months on your previous oral ART, and then switched over to the injectable in both trials. So I'll stop here and get your comments about <laughs> what we decided to do. Again, this is not a you know this is not at all the traditional criteria, but I was really against a wall um, in terms of what to do for this patient. Right, and I, you have to do what you think is best for the patient. And you know, clearly everything else you potentially could try was not gonna work. Uh, I think it's fascinating. I think starting it when someone's not already suppressed probably makes sense because why shouldn't it work from the beginning 
to do it with the one mutation to the integrase, I think is interesting. Might have honestly given me pause, but again, I don't know what the alternative was. So I think I'd love to hear how it worked, and it'll maybe help us understand better, you know, what the what we can do in those situations. You did what you were expected to do as a caring physician. Your option was to leave this patient and say, oh, okay, well, there's nothing I can do. Not only did you work as a clinician, you worked as a scientist. Because in fact, this is how progress occurs in medicine. Mm -hmm. You ask new questions. And this is the new questions that some people have been trying to answer in a very sort of a, with the breadth, bated breadth. Right, through a study, for example, the ACT 5359, which yes. you know a lot about. But that study even wouldn't address the issue that you have now. That This patient would not even allow you to achieve suppression and then switch. In fact, I actually feel very close to this patient, which is, in a way, I had to trust him to do what we did, which is to start injectables, because I did extract a promise from him. Um, because he had to trust me and I had to trust him and the promises that he would come regularly for the injections. Right. That's the commitment that you really need, thinking about long-term uh, adherence and success with the injectables. Because as you know, they're not like the pills, right? If a patient gets the injection mm. and they fail to show up for a long time, mm -hmm. not only are we worried about failure, we're f worried about failure with resistance. Yeah. And in fact, one thing, remember that AIDS paper, um, this actually was just published last year that showed the th risk factors for Absolutely. failing yes. on, uh, in the FLARE ATLAS and ATLAS 2M trials, putting all the failures together because as you both indicated, the failures are not are of great concern because the failures can occur with insulin mutations and um, cabotegravir is, you know, it doesn't have the highest genetic barrier to resistance. I don't think of it as bictegravir or dolichegravir, so yeah. it's, a, it's a disastrous failure. But what's also known is that you need two yeah. of those factors for them to be significant. For example, if you had one, well, in when they did this modeling study, they found that if you had only one of those risk factors, your risk was not really that increased. But, yes. but if you had two or more, the risk was increased. But there have been patients who failed with none of these risk factors. I guess that's the bottom line. And that adherent. And adherent. That's my concern is that even on-time injections, obviously there's pharmacokinetic variability in where you put the drug. Right. Did you get it deep enough in? Yeah. Is it, how does it elute out of the intramuscular or subcutaneous compartment in the case of lenacapavir? So importantly, I think that's such an important point because one thing I do want to add about the three risk factors, the BMI above 30, mm -hmm. there was a nice study at the European AIDS meeting that showed, um, and then a follow-up study in the British uh, Journal of Clinical Pharmacology that showed that if you inject with a longer needle, uh, those who have a BMI of greater than 30, so it was actually specifically a two-inch two needle, two inch, yeah. that you can get past the subcutaneous uh, tissue that's larger in, in the BMI, higher by BMI people, get down to the intramuscular layer, and then you have a wider distribution and your cabotegravir so levels important. go up. And I think that's something, again, art of medicine, but like this is, things we never used to think about with the oral ART, but we have to right. start thinking about injections. If you have implants, for example, you know, how do you get around the implants? Right. Um, right. So it, it's really important to follow that, the guidelines. And one thing I've also learned is that the giver of the injection also matters. They have to have experience and it gets better with time. Mm -hmm. And of course, pain is, is, is an issue that I tell patients, well, show me a human being in whom you will inject a needle 1.5 inches or 2 inches and they will feel nothing. Mm. I think you'll feel something. But what we've learned is that over time, the incidence of those complaints go down. So we started them on every four week um, uh, injectable cabotegravir or piverine. Of course, we did the uh, you know induction dose and then, and then eventually went to the maintenance dose. So I will say that after one dose, his viral load went down to less than 30. Um, and he has been now 10 injections and counting. And he is not only virologically suppressed, but he is a new person. Mm -hmm. And I would really like you to hear the second follow-up uh, to hear from my patient. So when I started the, the long-acting meds, it was a Hail Mary for me and my doctor. Um, my counts were really low. My viral load was super high. It had been that way for a little while. And I could not remember to take my meds. And so my doctor 
brought up the long acting meds that I just came out of uh, trials and she's, you know, mentioned to me that we could try them and uh, it actually worked. Like I called Monica two weeks after I started taking the meds and I told her like, I don't know what is in these meds, but it's amazing. Like I feel great. Like I'm 41, fixing to be 42 years old and I feel like I'm in my twenties again. Even though I've been under stress since these long acting meds, I have not had, like I haven't had a dip in, in my health as far as that goes. You know what I mean? Like even though I've been under stress because I'm back to work, thank God. You know what I mean? I look forward to going to get my, my shots every month because I know that's going to keep me feeling like this. Right. And, and just like your patient affirmed the value of this injectable in his own life, we heard the same report from clinical trials when patients were asked to compare mm -hmm. their satisfaction with the injectable after they'd switched it in comparison to what they felt when they were on the oral regimen. And consistently, patients felt better. They described it, although they were patients who wanted the injectable, but you're not going to give the injection to somebody who didn't want it in any case. And so these were patients saying, yes, I've gone through the oral pill, I prefer um, this injectable and I'm more satisfied with it. And when patients were compared between those who got four weeks and eight weeks, those actually were getting eight weeks. They express the preference compared to four weeks. So we'll see if your patient gets to I eight weeks at some point. I am going to, we'll I, how, we're how 10 how months works. and counting, and his virologic suppression rate, you know, it's been consistently less than 30. So um, we're going to discuss next visit, going yeah. to eight weeks. And I think we shouldn't undercount the value of success. Yeah. I mean, clearly it's great that he's undetectable. Clearly it's great that he's, you know, sort of, achieved success with this medicine, but also it may change his whole life. It may change his outlook for the future. You can and he hear owes it, it to, in his, to his relationship. I will tell you that he went back to work. It's amazing. He uh, hadn't worked in years. Right. He is has such a new lease on life. He is so joyful. This is a really a partnership that you've entered into this patient. And of course, like we said before, this is the stuff of studies, right? Yes. This is not something that anybody can then go tomorrow and say, oh, my patient is like Dr. Gandhi's patient, I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So this is the pilot program that we started at Ward 86, and it's only, I'd like this patient, if there's no other option, that we would start with virologic non-suppression. Actually, out of our 67 individuals that we started on long-acting ERT, more than half are virologically suppressed. They just had other reasons to want to do long-acting. We have not allowed, of course, any ropivirine-associated mutations in, but because when people fail, they fail with multiple NCD mutations, just on occasion, if we're desperate, we'll allow one NCD mutation in, um, like this patient with the N155H. And uh, we've only allowed that twice in the um, 29 people that we've started without virologic suppression, and they, they've remained suppressed. So that's our um, pilot program. and. Um, we are uh, uh, putting out a publication or preparing it for publication now, and we look forward to talking to you about it all at IAS where we'll be presenting this data. Yeah, really terrific, terrific data. You ought to be congratulated uh, on, on Thank on you, this but well. I, it's the art of medicine that you, you all have taught me through your work. So thank you.